Good morning, everybody. I'm Strobe Talbot. It is my great honor to welcome you this morning. All of us here at Brookings are very proud to be hosting this event on the community of democracies prior to the ninth ministerial of the community at the State Department on Friday. We are especially pleased to have my friend, my mentor, and my boss, Secretary Albright, here with us this morning. She was instrumental. <laughs> she was instrumental in launching the community back at the turn of the century. We are also honored to have the new Secretary General, Tom Garrett, who brings more than two decades of de de democracy assistance and uh, the, 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 the values that come with democracy around the world uh, during his extraordinary career. In addition, we have a chance to thank his predecessor, Ambassador Maria Leisner of Sweden, and several other key figures in this enter enterprise as well. I'm thinking particularly about Mort Heilprin, a longtime member of the Brookings family, Robert Herman, Doug Rutz Rutzen, and NDI's Ken Wallach. I'm particularly happy that we are also graced with the presence of Tunisia's former Prime Minister, Mehdi Joma. He is co-chair with Secretary Albright of the Democracy and Security Dialogue of the Community of Democracies. Sec Secretary Albright will speak first, then Prime Minister Joma will speak, following their remarks Brookings Senior Fellow Ted Picone and Project Director for the report that you'll be hearing about will moderate a conversation with his co-lead, Cheryl Frank, and our two distinguished sp speakers. So Madam Secretary, once again, welcome to Brookings, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Strobe, and uh, thank you for uh, Brookings yet again playing host to an important discussion, and thank you all for coming. Uh, and it's good to see so many friends up here on the stage and, and very much in the audience. Um, I also want to thank the community of democracies and the leaders who are here with us today. And Tom, I'm so glad you've been able to take over this really important uh, position. It, it's uh, terrific. Uh, and Maria, you have been wonderful to work with, so thank you very, very much. Um, and Ted, um, you have really been the operations behind all this, and um, all the work that you've done has been terrific. And Cheryl, I think the, everything that you guys have done in producing this report and all the work that went into it, because together, um, you guys guided the project to completion, authoring not only the report that is being released today, but dozens of case studies and briefing papers that I think will greatly enrich policymakers' understanding of these issues. And more, without you, this would not have happened. So uh, you were there when we started all this. I have to say, I'm always very proud when people talk about um, the community of democracies and sometimes describe me as the mother of the community of democracies. More was the father. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but one of the things that happened uh, at the beginning of the George W. Bush administration, uh, we had a meeting at the White House. They, they called the former people in to uh, explain what was going on in Iraq. 
And President Bush said, it's really very important for you all to support democracy in uh, Iraq and in the Middle East generally. And I thought that was terrific. And then the meeting ended, and President Bush said, I want to take you all into the Oval Office to show you how I redecorated it. And as we're walking in, I said, Mr. President, I'm so glad that you are so supportive of democracy, but you act as though you invented it when actually I did. And uh, <laughs> he did laugh. So, uh, But anyway, I, I am delighted to be a part of this and really very happy to have worked with the former Tunisian uh, Mehdi Roma. We have had a wonderful working relationship, and I have very much enjoyed going to Tunisia to see everything that's been going on because I think he is a leader um, and has been a leader during the transition to democracy, and his um, real experience has been totally invaluable. Over the past year, with support from the U.S. State Department and the National Democratic Institute and others uh, that have participated in this dialogue, we've explored the links between democracy and security. While members of this audience might find those connections to be self-evident, the truth is that many in Washington and elsewhere still don't believe that democracy should be a part of any foreign policy conversation. They see little connection between fostering democratic practices and the hard-headed pursuit of national interests. These attitudes have taken hold in some circles as the sense of euphoria that greeted the end of the Cold War, I'm sad to say, has dissipated. The financial crisis and the growing gaps between rich and poor have fueled anger and deepened doubts about the capacity of democracy to deliver on promises. Recent progress in a few countries and regions have been overshadowed by renewed authoritarianism in Russia, democratic backsliding in places such as Turkey, the rise of illiberal populism in Europe, democratic breakdown and state failure in authoritarian Venezuela, and the collapse of order in parts of the Middle East and North Africa. History's direction does not seem as obvious as it did a quarter of a century ago when many felt that the expansion of democracy was inevitable. Yet we know that international stability is still influenced greatly by whether freedom finds a foothold in nations where democratic forces are being repressed. The research conducted through this dialogue provides ample proof, backed by data, that democracy is more than just another form of government. It is also a powerful generator of international security and peace. What we found makes clear that while democracy may not provide a guarantee against aggression, it is the best political insurance available. Governments that are publicly accountable rarely start wars, while regimes that run roughshod over their own citizens are often indifferent to the rights of their neighbors. Moreover, in today's world, destabilizing conflicts erupt more frequently within, within societies than between them. And here again, democracies have a clear advantage because they embrace pluralism, encourage tolerance, and enable citizens to pursue change in a lawful and peaceful way. It's no coincidence that the hotspots most likely to harbor terrorists and generate waves of refugees are in areas of the world that are non-democratic. Meanwhile, democratic nations are more likely to support timely international action to fight violent crime, trafficking, and disease. So over the long term, democracy does provide stability, but the research offers a warning. Democratic transitions in the short term often lead to increased disorder and instability. Political liberalization may open new avenues for grievances to be heard, but those still trying to control the levers of power are all too often unwilling or incapable of implementing meaningful change. Corruption, which is the cancer of any democracy, can exacerbate the situation, locking in economic, political, and social advantages for a few at the expense of a broad social contract that benefits all. All this means that countries stuck in the messy middle of incomplete transition or illiberal democracy are especially vulnerable to conflict and violence. Advocates for democracy should not be deterred by these findings, but they can't be ignored either. What the findings make clear 
is that small d Democrats need to understand and respond to the legitimate desire of people everywhere for social order and economic growth. Now, I've been in many arguments about which comes first, economic or political development. The truth is they go together because people want to vote and eat. We in the international community need to invest in making democracy deliver in transitioning countries, not only because it's consistent with our ideals, but because it is in our interest for democratic transitions everywhere to succeed. And this is where the community of democracies has a truly essential role to play, for it brings together democracies new and old to share best practices and help each other meet common challenges. The principle of democratic solidarity is powerful, and we are reminded of this fact every time the community gets together, as it will later this week at the State Department. Around the world, governments band together for reasons of geography, economy, history, and religious faith, but there can be no better grounds for supporting one another than the shared commitment to freedom. And it's for that reason that the community of democracies deserves the enduring and high-level commitment of our leaders, not just at periodic meetings, but in our everyday policies and actions. We need to remember that building democracy is never easy and it is never fully accomplished. And even in the world's oldest democracy, which would be us, we continue to evolve. It is something to be worked towards, step by step, country by country, day by day. It can be noisy, inefficient, and at times exasperating, but it has also been tested over and over again. Nevertheless, its resilience should never be taken for granted. At the first gathering of the Community of Democracies in Warsaw, Polish Foreign Minister Bronisław Geremek emphasized both the value of freedom and its fragility. And I quote, the emergence of democracy was the most important development of our century. But he also reminded us of another 20th century lesson, which is that the tides of freedom will always be opposed. Today, it is this warning that is in our mind. And going forward, it must be on the minds of not only democracy and human rights activists, but the broader national security community here in the United States because it's no coincidence that the principal threats to the safety and security of American citizens emanate from authoritarian regimes, such as Russia, North Korea, and Syria, where the brutality of Bashar al-Assad enabled ISIS to take root. The United States must consider this reality when we make our foreign policy decisions. It's sometimes necessary to make alliances of convenience with countries that don't share our values, but even when we make such arrangements, we should never forget our long-term interests and our obligation to stand behind the homegrown champions for democracy and human rights. What our dialogue makes clear is that democracy and human rights must always be a pillar of our national security strategy and a part of our agenda, bilateral and multilateral. The word democracy cannot be left out of our foreign policy. Shedding our support for it would put in jeopardy our long-term economic, political, and security issues. Without this commitment, U.S. foreign policy would lose its moral compass, its most compelling claim for global respect, and ultimately the support and understanding of the American people. We must never forget that freedom is perhaps the clearest expression of purpose ever adopted, and it is the community of democracy's purpose. Like other profound aspirations, it can never be fully achieved. It's not a possession, it's a pursuit. And as today's event makes clear, it is the star by which the United States and our democratic allies must continue to navigate in the years to come. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to our discussion today. Madame la secrétaire d'État, chère Madeleine, uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking you uh, for this uh, collaboration. It was a good opportunity for me to, uh, to take advantage from uh, your large experience 
uh, and it was uh, really useful and uh, great to have you uh, in this uh, leading uh, this initiative. Madame la Secrétaire Générale, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, the new, uh, Monsieur le Président, Honorable Members of the Community of Democracies, Brookings and IS uh, Institutes, dear friends and guests, I would like to thank you all for your leadership. Leadership is about enabling others to achieve shared purpose. Our purpose is to advance and empower liberal democratic systems that deliver results for citizens and enable agency for the population. The uncertainty that is challenging this shared purpose is terror. And the feeling among, among the public opinion that democracies are not armed to face the security challenges of the 21st century. Both democracy and security are under daily threat from terror. It is as if we cannot, we can no longer tell the difference between peacetime and war time. And here, we are not talking about regular warfare, but about asymmetric wars, in which groups of individuals are able to wage war by themselves. And as a result, our democratic system, based on the rule of law, inclusive institutions, and free speech is being challenged. As we devise plans to counter attack terror, its causes and its consequences, parts of our population are losing patience. When a system is being challenged, people become indeed impatient and rely on authority to bring order back. We at the Community of Democracy have tackled the challenge to understand better the causes and consequences of these threats. I would like to thank the Community of Democracies team and all the stakeholders who were key in collecting and analyzing the data. The findings of the final report are clear. We need more, not less, of liberal democratics, democratic principles to tackle today's challenges. Because liberal democratic systems strengthen countries' resilience. And this was the Tunisian experience demonstrates. Shifting from a vertical to horizontal management approach has strengthened both liberty and security in Tunisia, making our institutions more inclusive, has created inspiring situation in Tunisia in which police, army, and the citizens were united united in areas where public services was weak and fought terror together. More liberal democratic systems create more agency. More agency leads to more inclusion. Inclusion leads to resilience. Democratic system cannot start from scratch. A specific level of state a specific level of institution capabilities is required. With a state monopoly of violence, over violence, but also with accountability. And accountability here is the force of the law <coughs> and not the law of the force. Creating 
creating more meritocratic, efficient, and inclusive institution is how we will progress and this what the community of democracy next step can be about. Thank you.